Hi guys. Okay, welcome to History with Robin. Uh, today we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, the things that happened in the United States leaving, leading up to the Civil War. Um, so I'm glad you guys could join me. Thank you guys all for being here. Hi, Lila. Hi, Shana. Hi, Akatsa. Uh, sorry. I am dressed as a, um, a farm wife who moved to Kansas, which we're going to talk a little bit about what that has to do with anything. Um, but this was the best I could do. See, I have my little apron and my uh, homesteader blouse on. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you guys so much for joining me. Hi, Cypress. Hi, Brando. I'm glad, Shana, I love, I'm glad that you love the Civil War. Um, Ranbeer, oh, uh, I am dressed up as a homesteader in Kansas. And Milo, why is the background the same as last time? I knew someone would notice that. Um, it's actually because when I was looking for uh, backgrounds, all I could find for the Civil War were battle scenes. And we're not quite going to talk about the battles. So I thought it might be a little, uh, a little misleading. So, um, so instead, we are going to talk about some people who moved uh, to Kansas and Missouri in an attempt to make sure that it would be a free state instead of a slave state. So I thought, eh, it's close enough. Okay, thank you guys uh, for joining me. Okay, we are going to start our presentation. Okay, here we go. So the Civil War part one, or sort of the events um, that led up to the Civil War. And we're gonna be talking about a couple specific people um, or a, per a specific person who was important in that time. Okay, so first off, what is a Civil War? So it's a war that's between groups or parts of the same country. Um, you know, the United States is not the only country which has had a civil war. Um, many other countries have had wars between different groups or parts of the same country. But when we talk about the civil war and we're talking about American history, this is the one that we're talking about. So does any, so America had a civil war about 160 years ago. Does anybody know the main reason why? Most people who have studied American history know the main reason why. Slavery, of course. So to understand that subject better, let's take a look back at history. So throughout history, there have been many times and places where certain people treated, uh, were treated like they weren't the same as other people, like they were less important. That's right, Ethan Good, slave, some states wanted slavery and some didn't. AG, that is right. Um, slavery and states' rights, those were both important things. Um, Kenan, what a great question. What does civil mean? And I think um, it means having to do with a country or uh, with a group. So you guys are right. Whoever said slavery, you are all right. You guys know all of that. So, so through history, and we've studied this before, like with the Aztecs and different groups, there have been um, leaders or people who were in charge of groups who didn't feel like other people had the same amount um, of rights as them. So of course, you know, it's a little bit more than just being mean, right? Um, so what is slavery? Or it's a little bit more than just taking away the rights or treating people like they're different. So slavery is when people are treated so badly that their life is not their own, but actually belongs to someone else. So a slave is a person who is made to do work for someone else by force. So they have no choice. And slaves are treated like a thing and not a person. They're something, they're like, even though they're not an object, they're sort of treated like they're an object that can be owned. Sasha, we are talking about um, the things which led up to the Civil War. Um, um, Shana, are we going to talk about Abraham Lincoln? We're going to talk about him a little bit, 
but we'll definitely talk about him more tomorrow. Um, but we will talk about him a little bit. Um, so in history, slaves were often people who had been captured in war. So in, in ancient countries like Egypt, China, India, Rome, Greece, um, when there was a war, the, the winning side would capture people from the losing side um, and make slaves of them. So in ancient history, all those countries, they made slaves of the people that they fought. Um, African tribes and Native American tribes often did the same thing to the people that they defeated. Um, so, so to get to the bottom of why any of them thought it was okay to make slaves of the de defeated people, we should find out why they were fighting in the first place. There might be a million reasons, like not enough food or land, but uh, behind that, be before actually fighting, to make themselves think that it was okay to do this, they had to come up with some reasons why those people were different from them. Shanna, thank you very much for telling me how to say your name. I apologize for saying it incorrectly. Um, so that's really the basis um, behind this idea of slavery. These the people who participated in it had to dream up reasons why these people were different from them because um, because otherwise you wouldn't treat people like they were property and not people. So those the other people might look different, they might speak a different language, they might follow a different religion, they might have more or less money, but people who fought and enslaved others had decided that those other people were different in some way from them. Um, what they overlooked was that no matter any of those things, any of the things that make us different from someone else, we're all humans and that all of us are important and we have rights to live our life as we wish as long as we don't harm others. So we were created equal, just like the Declaration of Independence says. <laughs> so in America, before the Civil War, uh, many people were not following these important ideas of, that were in the Declaration of Independence, that we were all created free and equal. Um, in the early 1600s, African tribes often fought other tribes and made slaves from the losing sides. Um, this was something that they had done for a long time. Um, English traders started buying some of those slaves and bringing them to Virginia and forcing them to do work. Because these Africans looked different, the English men who bought them decided that it was okay to keep them as slaves. And a little bit, um, of background, if you came to some of my earlier webinars, um, one of the reasons that um, slavery started in Virginia in the New World was because the Virginia Company, um, which was a, an English company, had come to the New World looking for gold, didn't find gold, but decided that they could grow tobacco. And so they had large plantations. Lila, you're right. It's good that people are different and that everyone is different. Um, and Shanna, you're right. It is that what makes us different is important and makes us special. And so um, that just wasn't considered to be that way then. Um, but you are right. It is that way now. Holly, how great that you're joining us from Virginia. Um, good. So in Virginia at the time, they had large farms called plantations and they had no machines and they needed a lot of workers to plant and harvest the crops. Mostly what they were growing was tobacco because the um, farmers in Virginia found out that they could grow a special kind of tobacco called Virginia tobacco and that they could sell it at a cheaper cost than Spanish tobacco and lots of people really liked it. So instead of in the beginning, um, those farmers in Virginia would hire people from England to come over and work um, but then they decided that they could actually buy and use slaves. So other colonies in the South, besides um, Virginia, had, other, had plantations as well. And they started using slaves as well. 
in colonies in the north, there were no large farms and um, they didn't have a need for as many workers. So that was one of the differences. One of the first differences between the north and the south was um, there was a lot more farming that went on in the south and um, there was less farming that went on in the north. Um, but in the north, even some of those colonists bought slaves anyway, though it was in much smaller numbers than they bought them in the south. And they often used them as servants or taught them to be carpenters or blacksmiths. Um, but as time went on, many in the north began to feel slavery was evil and they wanted to ban it. Bailey, great question. Who were the first slaves? Um, they were just uh, men and women and possibly even children who were brought over um, from Africa um, to work in the fields. I don't know. Unfortunately, I don't, I don't know their names, um, but those were who, that's who they were. So in 1789, when the Founding Fathers were writing the Constitution, five states had already banned slavery. And those are the blue states on the map. So you can see that's New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, um, Connecticut, the Vermont Republic, and Pennsylvania. So those five had banned slavery. And then five, oops, sorry guys, hold on one second. But eight, the red ones on the map, had not. Just one second, guys. So the ones that had not banned it um, were New York, New Jersey. Oh, who had banned it? Sorry, I got a little confused. The red ones on those maps, so that would be New York, New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. So, so there were five that had banned it and eight that had not. Um, those In those eight states, they had about 700,000 slaves working for them. And one of the things was that they thought without those slaves, they wouldn't be able to um, survive. So even though the main idea of the new country was freedom, the founders couldn't make the constitution ban slavery or those slave states wouldn't have joined. Um, so that was actually, I, that was one of the hard things about writing the constitution was you can see there were many states which felt strongly that slavery was wrong. And I'm sure there were many men that were part of that discussion that didn't want to have slavery in their new country. But they had to make a decision of what was best for the whole country. Um, so sometimes they had to make compromises on something and that was one of the compromises that they made. Um, Lorna, great question. When did people begin to think of the abolitionist way of thinking to abolish slavery? There were people at this time in the 1700s that felt that way, felt that was important. And so it sort of started, it even started before the Revolutionary War. There were men who were part of the Revolutionary War who felt strongly that they didn't want to have slave um, anymore. Slave territories. That's a great question. Who um, I'm not sure exactly, but I'm assuming slave territories means that is where the slaves lived as well. Um, Bailey, great question. Which country or state started slavery first? I'm not sure which country started it first, but in the new world, in, in what became the United States, it was Virginia, which, um, which where it started. Just trying to read your guys' great questions. And Oliver, you are right. Um, that was, they, they did have to make compromises on having slaves or no slaves. Um, uh, 
to make the Constitution. Aditya, thank you for telling me your name and I'm so glad that you're joining us from India. Okay, so in 1800, a few years later, as the new country expanded, new states in the South, there were new states that were formed in the South with large plantations and they joined the country and they became slave states, states where slavery was allowed. But the new ones in the North without plantations didn't join with allowing slavery. So in some states in the North the, um, that had slaves um, in 1789, they actually chose to ban slavery. Um, you can see now that there were eight, what we call free states where slavery is banned and nine sta slave states. So you can see as they started to join, um, As they started to join, some states decided that they wanted to allow slavery and some decided that they didn't want to allow slavery. At the same time, some other states were actually banning slavery. So it was becoming slightly uh, more even. So in 1821, um, remember we talked a little bit about expansion to the West in earlier webinars. Um, and so the United States, what we consider the United States, continued to expand and more and more states joined. Um, so by 1821, there were 12 free states and 12 slave states. And um, just three years before this point in 1821, in the slave state of Maryland, a boy was born who would become important to the cause of freedom and freeing the slaves. Um, and he actually was also important to the idea of all people um, being treated equally. Um, he spoke up a lot about um, slavery, and, um, but he also um, defended other people who he felt were treated not equally as others. But first, before we talk about him, um, which you'll meet him in a moment, um, and before he could become important to the clause, cause of slavery, he would have to free himself. A.G., great guess, that boy is Frederick Douglass. Um, that is a great, that was very well done to know that. So his name was Frederick Douglass. He is a really interesting and very important man. Um, he was born into slavery. Um, and when he was a baby, he was taken from his mother. Um, and he never knew for sure who his father was. And that was something that sometimes happened to children who were born into slavery because they were considered to be property or objects they, did, they could sometimes be taken away um, from their parents. So when he was 12, his master's wife, the wife of the man who owned him, started to teach him to read, to give him a chance at a better life. Um, Sasha, great question. When was he born? So he must have been born in 1818. Um, but his master, so his master's wife, um, sorry, I went the wrong way. Um, his master's wife wanted to teach him to read. That's what that picture is at the bottom of my, pre of my um, slide. But his master, Hugh Auld, made her stop. Um, one of the things that he thought and many other people thought in the South was that um, slaves that learned to read might try to escape to freedom, um, which was a very common belief at that time. And, you know, if, and if you think about it, what would it be like today for you if you were told that you had to, you couldn't go to school and you were forced to start uh, to stop learning? That would be really hard. Um, but so Douglas didn't, so even though his master's wife couldn't teach him to read anymore, um, he didn't let that stop him. And he actually continued to learn to read and write um, by secretly teaching himself. Um, years later, he has a, a famous quote that is, knowledge is the pathway from slavery to freedom. 
Um, and that is one of the things uh, I think is really important. I think it's really true. Um, if you don't, if you don't know how to read and you can't read and you can't read a lot of different things, it, to me, it's really hard to consider yourself to be free because if you can't read, then you just have to believe the things that other people tell you and you can't find out and learn for yourself. So, so Frederick Douglass, he started teaching 40 other slaves to read in a church before slave owners found out and broke up the meeting armed with clubs. Um, so it was a risk. He knew it was dangerous and a risk um, to teach these other slaves to read, but that's how important he thought it was. So when Douglas was 16 years old, um, his master sent him to work for another slave master who whipped him. Um, but Douglas fought back and that master never beat Douglas again. So he was a very strong man, not even, not just physically, but also, um, intellectually uh, with his uh, smarts. Um, Isis, I agree, I would be very mad if someone told me that, um, that I couldn't learn the things that I wanted to. Um, Bailey, I don't know the name of the new master, but that would be something that you um, could research when we're done. So Douglas did try to escape, but he failed. Um, then in 1838, when he was 20, he met and he fell in love with a woman named Anne Murray. She was a free black woman living in Baltimore. So even in states where slavery was allowed, um, there were um, people who had either been slaves and been freed by their masters or had bought their freedom or were born free. And so that was a difference between being a slave. You could be a free um, you know, black or mat, um, man or woman. Um, she gave him money and a sailor uniform to use as a disguise. Um, and they made a plan for him to escape. So he jumped onto a train and because he looked like a sailor, he got all the way to New York City without getting caught. And New York was a free state. So no one made him go back to his master. And Anna actually met him in New York and they got married. So that, so, um, so that was how Frederick Douglass became a free man. Um, after they got married in New York, they moved to Massachusetts, which was a free state where slavery was not allowed. Um, people wanted to hear his story. They were interested in his story. And so he began to speak at meetings of people who wanted to abolish slavery. So abolish something means to get rid of something so it can't or won't come back. And the people who believed in abolishing slavery were called abolitionists. And that's the name um, of the people who uh, were against slavery, wanted to end it, and were working to get rid of it. Um, Douglas became an abolitionist himself and spoke at many gatherings trying to convince people to end slavery. And he was a really good and um, a effective public speaker. Um, so Douglas, one of the other things that he did was he went on a six month tour of the Northern states speaking in favor of abolishing slavery. So he would go from state to state or city to city and the, um, the abolitionists, the people who wanted to abolish slavery in those cities or to get more support for their, that idea, would set up meetings. Um, and Frederick Douglass would go to them and he would talk. And he was very convincing, like I just said before, and he actually made many people want to abolish slavery. But sometimes it wasn't always perfect because sometimes he ran into people who didn't want to abolish slavery. Um, while speaking to a crowd in Indiana, some of them actually attacked him and he had to fight back to keep from being killed. Um, they broke it, he broke his hand in fighting back, but then other people came and, and helped him so he could get to safety. Aditya, you're right, he was a great man. He was an author um, and a statesman. So besides talking about freeing slaves, 
Douglas actually started helping Slave to, to escape. He became um, involved in the Underground Railroad. And if you're not familiar with that idea, the Underground Railroad is not an actual railroad um, and it isn't actually underground, um, but it was the name for a, um, for a route or a way for slaves to run away and escape to the north without getting caught. So um, that was just sort of the name for it, the Underground Railroad. So if it wasn't underground and it wasn't a railroad, what was it? Now I wanna show you guys this picture that I have here. Um, you can see the blue states are slave states, the green states are free states, and these red arrows are different routes um, that people could, that the estate, uh, the slaves who were trying to get their freedom could follow to get to freedom. And you'll notice some of the arrows end up in the northern free states and some arrows as well end up in Canada because that was another destination um, for them. Shana, good, that is true. The slaves would, on the Underground Railroad, many of times they would, um, they would travel at night because it was easier that way. So the Underground Railroad was just a name for, was just people who secretly worked together to help slaves get to freedom. Those people were called conductors. Um, and because like on a train, the person who is on the train is a conductor. Um, so people called conductors would sneak into, into the slave state. Then they'd guide the slaves at night along um, a route wherever every 15 to 20 miles was a house or a farm that belonged to someone who was also against slavery. Those people at that farm um, would feed and hide the slaves in their basement or their barn. Some houses even had secret rooms, um, like behind a bookshelf or that looked like another door or looked like just a plain wall that was actually like a secret compartment where they could hide the slaves, um, the escaping slaves. Then the next night, the conductor would pick them up and take them along the route to the next house. Um, I don't, Mackenzie and Denali, I don't have her in this presentation, but you are right, Harriet Tubman was probably one of the most famous and important conductors um, on the Underground Railroad. She was, um, she was an escaped slave herself who made it to freedom. And then she, um, she went back into the South many, many times to help many, many other slaves escape to freedom too. Um, and it was really dangerous for her because all of the slave catchers wanted to catch her. Um, you're right, in this picture, I know it looks kind of funny, um, but I think what they're doing is they're just helping a, an escaped slave up the side, you know, so she can continue on the Underground Railroad. So, so once the slaves got to a free state, they weren't fully safe because even the law, even in a state where um, slavery was banned, said that slaves had to be returned to their owner. Um, so if you made it to Massachusetts and you got caught by someone called a slave catcher, which were people that plantation owners hired to go into free states and try to find their escaped slaves and bring them back, then you would have to go back to your master. So in, in a lot of those free states, um, there were people who didn't really enforce that law um, but still, it's possible that someone who had escaped slavery wouldn't feel quite safe. Um, so there were a couple of ways that they could be helped with that. The first way uh, was for someone with enough money to pay the slave owner for freedom. Um, so people would sometimes raise money to help the former slaves buy their freedom um, from the slave owner 
and they'd send that money to the slave owner and then they would allow them to be free. Um, so sometimes that would work for most to get safe. They had to go all the way to Canada. So once they were in Canada, they were um, completely safe. They could not be brought back um, to their owners, their former owners. So for many um, slaves, they had to travel all the way to Canada to really feel like they weren't going to be forced to be a slave again. Um, so, but now going back to Frederick's Frederick Douglass. So the way he got his full freedom after escaping was that his friends collected enough money and they paid his slave master to buy his freedom. So he was one of the many um, slaves who escaped slavery, made it to the north where slavery wasn't allowed, but still was in danger of being taken back. So after his friends helped him out with that and bought his freedom, um, he was able to stay in New York safely and not have to worry about um, being taken. Um, he then set up his house so he could hide um, escaped slaves who reached New York and then help them get to Canada. He and his wife, Anna, and their friends helped 400 escaped slaves um, get to freedom in this way. And while that is a lot, um, while that is a lot, of um, escaped slaves that he helped, um, he really wanted to help more. Um, great question, Ryan. How much money would it cost to free a slave? I think it depends on a couple of things. It depended on the age um, of the slave uh, because they, um, slave masters felt that like a young person would uh, be worth more because they could work for longer. Um, sometimes women were worth more because they could have babies and those babies would be slaves. It's, it's kind of hard to say um, the exact amount. In a book that I read, it was like $50 was an example of the offer that an abolitionist made for a little girl's um, freedom. Um, and while that maybe doesn't sound like a lot of money now, um, back then it definitely was. Um, great. What are they doing in this picture? That's a great question. I think what it is, is it looks like the man who's in the hole reaching for the baby that actually looks like in a, um, barn or something like a secret, a secret hiding compartment, um, or like a trap door so that they, the escaped slaves could go down into the bottom of the barn. They could put the little door over it throw some hay on the ground, and then know what it would look like a normal barn. That was a great question. Lorna, like I said before, I think the cost really depends on the, um, the slave master. Um, and I think also it depends on how desperate the slave master is because he, he might be willing to take a lower cost because he thinks he will never uh, recover his slave, which is not a bad thing at all. It's actually a good thing. Um, so William Douglas, he wanted to do more to help um, get freedom for um, and to end slavery. So Douglas had a friend whose name was William Garrison. William Garrison was also an abolitionist and he had a whole newspaper that he published that persuaded people to support um, abolition of slavery. And this gave Douglas an idea. That's a picture of William, oh, sorry guys. That was a picture of William Garrison and his newspaper, the National Anti-Slavery Standard. Um, so Douglas's speeches were really good, but he thought he could maybe reach more people because you can only have so many in-person face-to-face conversations, um, reach more people about how bad slavery actually was with a newspaper. So maybe he even hoped he could reach enough people to abolish slavery for good. So in 1847, Douglas began his own abolitionist newspaper. He called it the North Star. And that's a picture of Frederick Douglass. And that's a picture of his newspaper. Yes, his name was Frederick Douglass, not William Douglass. Sorry, I think I got mixed up between my men's names. 
And Aditya, you're right, he did become a national leader for the abolitionist movement in Massachusetts and New York. He did so much to help uh, more slaves. So now I talked a little bit earlier about how he didn't only speak out about um, slavery, but he used his abilities to, um, and the resources that he had to help all people that he felt weren't being treated equally. And one of these groups of people he felt weren't being treated equally were women. So in 1848, the law said that women couldn't vote. They didn't have a say in the government and they couldn't vote. A woman named Elizabeth Stanton, she wanted to change that. She felt that wasn't right or fair. So Douglas knew she was right and he worked with her to allow, um, to get the law changed to allow women to vote. That year in 1848 in New York was the first large meeting about women's rights. And Douglas used his powerful skills as a speaker to support the, that idea. He also put his words of support for women's rights in his newspaper. Now, that was just another example of something that he did to help, though not necessarily tied to the Civil War. But all during this time, um, the United States had continued to expand. And in 1846, there were now 26 states. Um, 13 were free and 13 were slave states. So they got equal, there were equal numbers of states which felt, you know, one way or another. Um, because of the work of uh, Frederick Douglass and other abolitionists like his friend William Garrison, more and more people were moving against slavery and starting to feel that it was really wrong. Um, but, so, and that was mostly happening in the northern part of the United States, but in the southern areas where there were large plantations, most people still really felt strongly that they needed slaves and that they, they didn't want to end it. Um, every time a new state was added, there was a big argument between those that hated slavery and those that wanted to keep it. Um, they would argue about whether the new state should be free or a slave state. Um, the slave states didn't want to be outnumbered by the free states because they wanted to be able to make their opinions known. Um, they thought if that happened, if there were more free states than slave states, they would be forced um, to abolish slavery. Um, by, so 10 years after that, by 1858, it was 17 free states to 15 slave states. So they, that was, they were quickly becoming outnumbered. Um, Lorna, we're going to talk about Abraham Lincoln briefly at the end of this, but we will definitely um, talk about him more tomorrow. Um, so let's look at that map again. Um, so here, one important thing, remember I said I was dressed as someone who lived in the Kansas Territory. So if you notice where Kansas Territory is in the middle, um, a new law was passed in 1854 that when a territory, so it wasn't quite a state yet, but it was a territory, which was the step right before coming a, becoming a state. Um, the people in that territory would have a vote and um, they would decide whether it would be a free state or a slave state. So now Kansas was gonna become a state. So what happened next was thousands of settlers from slave states and free states, both flooded into Kansas to try to make, become the majority and to make it the way they wanted. So there were people who were abolitionists who were trying to get in there to make their, their group the largest and people from slave states who were doing the same. So, but sometimes they fought. Small armies of pro-slavery people who wanted slavery and anti-slavery fighters traveled around the territory, burning down buildings and trying to kill or scare away the settlers who believed in the opposition. Both sides did this. It wasn't just one side that was doing it. So, so it was a little bit of a scary time <laughs> to live in Kansas, um, but, by 1858, um, the people of Kansas um, against slavery won the vote to make Kansas a free state. Um, after that, it calmed down a little bit, but some violence continued for different years. Um, I'm almost done, I promise. Thank you, ladies, for helping me keep an eye on my time. <laughs> 
Um, by 1861, there were 34 states, and now the free states outnumbered the states 19 to 15. The th southern states, which had slaves, were getting really nervous that in Congress, that's the part where the laws get made for the country, that they would be outvoted and they'd be forced to free their slaves. Um, they got even more nervous um, in March of 1861 when a president was elected who was not in favor, in favor of slavery. And I'm sure you guys all know who that is. That is Abraham Lincoln. So um, now the states with slaves felt that they had no choice but to separate themselves from the United States and form their own country. Um, they had been nervous that they would be forced to um, end slavery. They'd be forced to change their way of life um, and forced to do what states that are different from them uh, want them to do. So they decided to separate themselves. Sorry, guys, hold on. Even if it meant a war between the states. So that's the Civil War, is this war. And um, so that is the end of my presentation. But tomorrow, we're going to be talking about the second half of it, the next part of the Civil War. We're going to learn a little, we're going to learn, talk about um, Abraham Lincoln, Frederick Douglass, and the things that um, happened in the Civil War. So I made it right under the wire. Thank you guys uh, for joining me. I hope you learned a little bit about um, the events that led up to the Civil War, which are an important part of knowing um, what the states and groups of people um, were actually fighting for. Um, if you guys are interested in finding out some more about the books that I use to create these presentations, um, you can check out heronbooks.com. Um, Thank you guys so much for joining me. Um, bye. I hope you guys have a really great uh, rest of your day. And I hope to see um, a lot of you guys tomorrow when, we, when I do my next one about the Civil War.